Uh, Hebrews chapter 10 is a, uh, this chapter is a beautiful uh, passage of scripture that starts to tie the application of living out what the book of Hebrews has expressed to us. And so if you are, if you're just jumping in for the first time or whether you've been a part of the series to, together, just by way of understanding, uh, we've experienced in, in this book of Hebrews how Jesus is the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament pictures. Um, said another way, the author of Hebrews is really ripping away from, from religion and, and giving us a, a broader understanding of what it means to have a healthy spiritual life in Jesus. He's taking out dead religious living and is replacing it with the substance that is truly Christ. The whole picture of the Old Testament is intended to find its fulfillment in Jesus. And for many people, this is a difficult concept to grasp because we like our, our, our whitewashed, sterilized, religious performance. And following after Jesus is relational and relationships tend to, to be messy and we are very much task-oriented, religious-minded, I think, by, by nature. And so when we start talking about Jesus being the fulfillment of all these things and the Old Testament long, no longer being necessary, but now you're called into a relationship with Christ through the new covenant, that sort of change, that paradigm shift in, in our mind in following after Jesus in faith, I think it's a, it's a life journey for one, but it, it can be a difficult thing for people to grasp because change is difficult. Uh, we, by nature, we are creatures of habit and we we don't like change. And I think the author of Hebrews knows this. And so this is why he's taken time through 10 chapters to paint the picture for us of the, the substance that is Jesus and how he is the fulfillment of everything and how our faith can rest confidently in him. If you remember the picture of what the, the story of Hebrews is about, the, the individuals that are being written to in this book are about to go through some tremendous hardship because of their faith in, in Christ or, or the faith that they're being called to in Christ. And when you're looking at putting, putting your faith in something, you want to know that it is dependable. Can I really rest on this? Is this a, a solid rock? Is, is that change, that, that paradigm shift in, in my faith, my belief, my trust, is, is it worth it or do I need to stay in this religious mentality because this is where I'm, I'm comfortable in life? Uh, Karl Barth gave a masterful quote regarding following after the one true God. And when you read if you read anything by Karl Barth, one of the things I like to keep in mind about him is um, Karl Barth w was a minister during the reign of Nazi Germany under the German influence. And he fought uh, with other believers at this time, not all believers, a lot, some believers pursued after uh, just appeasing Hitler, but, but he was a part of this Christian group that, that fought against Hitler, fought against Nazi power, wanted to keep the Nazis from creating a, a state-run church. And, and he began to help lead a, a group of Christians in a church movement that was called the Confessing Church. And one of the statements that he gave, I like to keep that in, those thoughts about Karl Barth and his bravery in mind when I read about uh, him and, and the statements he said. But one of the masterful quotes that I've just read from Barth, it said this, if God doesn't make us mad, we're not worshiping him but ourselves. A kind of interesting quote. I, I want you to know this morning, we're not here to say, okay, everyone get ticked off about following God. That's not, that's not what we're after. But, but what Karl Barth is saying here, it, what, what he means in this statement is if, if our God never contradicts us, always likes what we like, hates what we hate, he's not the real God. All we've done is we've deified our personal preferences and, and that personification of those preferences, we've titled God. Uh, if God completely agrees with everything that you agree with, there is a problem. Because what the Bible teaches about us is that our, our, our flesh wars against him. And there is a battle within the soul of what is Lord. Are you Lord or is God Lord? Now, the Bible calls us to surrender to the King of kings and Lord of lords, but there is a waging between the spirit and the flesh within our lives. And, and if you're walking life today and God agrees with everything that you agree with, it's probably because you've just turned God into the personification of everything that you already like as an individual. God challenges you to more. And God calls you to something higher in life than self. 
And that for us becomes a part where we, we battle with what it means to truly trust in the Lord because there's a piece of us that wants to hold on to everything that we think is precious and we don't want to change. But there is this confidence or this trusting of faith and recognizing that Jesus is more than sufficient. And that's what the book of Hebrews is. The weighing of this battle. Religious people devoted to religious ideas and the concepts it created as if it was an end in itself. And we've discussed those concepts together in law and temple and Sabbath uh, and, and priest and prophet and king. And they made it an end in itself. But Jesus is the picture of all of that. And it was intended to point everything uh, in the Old Testament to the sufficiency of what Christ is for us. And in fact, when you start in the book of Hebrews in chapter 10, verse 1, it's, it says it this way in referring to the idea of the law. For the law, Old Testament law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of the things, can never by the same sacrifice which they offer continually year by year make perfect those who draw near. Now look, I, I said this with us in, starting in chapter 5 all the way to chapter 10. He's, he's carrying this one giant theme, this concept of priest and law and temple. Because when you read the Mosaic Covenant given the Old Testament, when God called the slaves out of Egypt that became the, the nation or the people of Israel, God gave them at Mount Sinai as he called them out of Egypt the, the Mosaic Covenant. It was law, it was priest, it was temple. And now what he's saying here, this law being symbolic of it all, this law, since it's only a shadow of good things to come, can, is not the very form of the things, can never, by the same sacrifice which they offer continually under this practice, make perfect those who draw near to God. It will not perfect you. And so the concept of these pictures of the Old Testament, what it's describing it as is Shadows. Another way to, to think about it, this, this summer for me, um, July is a month of insanity. Actually, the summer is usually a month of insanity with ministry. You get out of the typical norm that we do throughout the school year, and we're doing different kinds of ministry, but it's, it's very busy. But one of the things I noticed this year, and, and I think it happens every year, is that we're, we're, because we're doing new things, we're making new memories, especially me and, and, and my family. And so when that happens, we just pull out the camera, aka the phone, you know, and you can, you can just make those memories last anywhere. But, but those memories are just shadows, right? Now, this is totally a dude thing of me, but at one point of these memories, we had a baby this summer. Well, not me, but my wife, so she gets the credit for that. But, so she had a baby, did all that hard, hard work, but, but coming home from the hospital, I saw the DeLorean. <laughs> Isn't that cool? So we had a kid. That should be the top thing, okay? But then coming back on the bottom left, I saw the DeLorean, and when I pulled up beside it, you'll be sad to know with me, Marty McFly was not driving, all right? So no back to the future, but I saw that. A lot of great experiences, but you know what these are? The shadows. You know, the cool thing about shadows is they take me to a place. Like, you look at my family's photos and you think, big deal, who cares? My, one of my favorite photos, the bottom right there, I feel like it took away like 10 years of my life. I'm back in my 20s. It was a wonderful thing, <laughs> that picture. But, but, but these are just shadows. And, and the, but the beauty of the shadow is that it, it takes me back to a moment that was real. Right? Some, something special. I appreciated about being there with people around me that, that made that moment prize. But you know, one of the things I don't do with these pictures, when I want to experience what those experiences were in those pictures and continue in those experiences, I don't go back to the pictures and say to the pictures, I love you, I kiss you, uh, thank you, family, be with me. That, that's not the intention of the picture. If I want to continue to experience what I've experienced, I don't hold on to the shadow but I grab hold of the substance, right? I experienced more of those moments with my family that made those pictures a beautiful opportunity. That's what scripture is saying in Hebrews chapter one, talking about the Old Testament. That the images of, of what we come to see is significant in Jewish practice in the Old Testament. Beautiful things, but they're shadows of a greater purpose. 
If you were to read on in, in this chapter, verse 2, it says, Otherwise, why would they not have ceased to be offered because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness of sins? But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So what he's doing in this verse here is he's challenging the idea of these shadows. He, he's saying if, if, if the, the Old Testament sacrifices, if they were really intended to satisfy what God wanted to satisfy, how come you've always got to do it? Like, like why, why do you always have to go to the temple and keep sacrificing animals? When is enough going to be enough? The answer, rhetorically, never. Never. You know why? Shadows were never intended to satisfy you need the substance. If the shadow was ever intended to satisfy, you know what you would have done? You would have seen the shadow one time and, and departed from it because that would have been enough. But what it's saying in verse two to four, when God created the sacrificial system, the reason you had to repetitiously continue to go back to the temple and make those sacrifices is because the sacrifice was never enough. The religious performance is never enough. And so over and over, year after year, they would go back with the blood of bulls and goats making these sacrifices, but it was never sufficient. And yet the picture for us and the substance is that Jesus is. Remember what Jesus said about the law. He, he said, I came not to destroy it in Matthew 5, 18, but to fulfill it. Jesus is the only one who could righteously demand uh, or fulfill the demands of the law. And so Jesus becomes, in that sense, the true Israelite because he lives out the very intentions of what the law entails. No man can do it. James chapter 2, verse 10 says, He who is guilty of one sin and breaking the law is guilty of all of the law. The idea of temple, last week we looked at Jesus is the temple. I mean, Jesus said, destroy the temple and in three days I will rebuild it. In John chapter 1, verse 14, it tells us that we beheld his glory, that Jesus tabernacled among us. Jesus himself is the temple. The, the word tabernacle, that is, that is the presence of God. And when God became flesh, his presence was among us. And now because Jesus is the true temple, Paul says things like this in Galatians 2.20. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, it's not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And so that's why the Bible says to us in passages like 1 Corinthians 3.16 and 6.19 that you are the temple of God. That you who belong to Jesus, that God's presence dwells within you. That's why we don't go to temples as Christians. We experience the presence of God right where we are. To reassert any of these religious practices is an affront to God and an insult to what Jesus has done for us. We are the temple because of what Christ has done. To chase after anything apart from Jesus is to pursue shadows. He is the substance. We talked about Jesus and being the Sabbath. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. The Hebrew word for rest is Sabbath. A Sabbath isn't Sunday. It's every moment of every day that you choose to rest in the sufficiency of who Jesus is. When you do that, you are Sabbathing in Christ. That Jesus is the true prophet. In Hebrews chapter 1, it starts off that way. In former times, God spoke to us in the prophets. Today, he speaks to us in Jesus. Not only that, the Bible goes on to tell us in, in Hebrews chapter 7, this tying together of Melchizedek priesthood and Jesus being priest and king. It's a fulfillment of Psalm 110. I mean, it reiterated, reiterated all through Hebrews that Jesus is priest and king. And so you see, Jesus is, is the fulfillment of, of all of, of those things to go back to any of it and uh, observe any of it and live in all of it. It's just the chasing of shadows. Colossians says it like this. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, new moon celebration, or Sabbath day. The, these are a shadow of the things that were to come. The substance, however, is found in Christ. Verse 5 to 7 of Hebrews explains why. Therefore, 
when he comes into the world, he says, sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. And whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. He's saying to us in this passage that Sacrifices in the Old Testament will never satisfy. But Jesus does. You think about in the Old Testament when they would sacrifice, sacrifice bulls and goats, um, they would sacrifice other things as well, but uh, when they would make the sacrifice, it doesn't substitute for man because it isn't a human being. It's blood. But the symbol of what took place was beautiful. Like they would sacrifice the sins of the animal. When, when someone come into the temple for the sacrifice, recognizing their need to be made right with God, when an animal was to be sacrificed, the person who was a sinner would place their hands on the head of the animal and they would confess their sins, looking for something to atone for their sins. And as they confessed their sins, they were placing their faith and trust in the symbol of what would ultimately come in Jesus. And they would sacrifice the animal. And on the altar, there were certain sacrifices that took place that when they would sacrifice the animal on the altar, they would take the blood of the animal and they would actually uh, take it over the horns of the altar. On the corner of the altar, there were horns. And they would uh, touch the corner of the altar where the horns were. And the horns symbolized power. And it was as if to say the blood of the sacrifice had the, had the authority to cover over the power and judgment of God, the righteous demands of God. But they were merely animals. God is a righteous God. And God is a good God. And God is a just God. And for his justice to be satisfied for a humanity that has violated and committed treason against the king, it, de it demands justice being brought against humanity. Animals can't substitute. So it works like this in our, in our mind. For God to be a just and, and loving God, he, he needs to be a good judge. And, and, and if you think about this in terms of the word justice comes from a courtroom setting, you think it in terms of a courtroom. If, if you've been violated against, you go before a judge and the judge declares whoever violated you as guilty, but then turns around and just says you're free. You would look at that judge and say that judge is, is neither just and because he's not just, he is not good. And because I don't experience this goodness, he cannot be loving. In order to be a loving, good judge, he must be just. And when you look at what God says about humanity and treason against him and taking this, this kingdom that he has created, this world that belongs to him, and violating against him and claiming it for ourselves and living for our own glory, we are guilty before this king. And to be a good judge, he must be just. He demands our sentence. In this passage, it's saying to us, Jesus lives out that sentence. His demands are for the justice to be taken place against humanity. Jesus comes, offers that. And so in this, we see at the cross of Christ, both the justice of God and the loving grace of God being played out because what happens is Jesus steps in for humanity by being human himself. He dies for our sins. He's declared guilty. He takes sin upon, uh, upon him for our well-being and his grace pours into our lives because he has, he has declared righteous those who put their faith in the payment that he has made for us. Let me just ask it like this. When, when Jesus died on the cross, he said in John 19, 30, paid in full. It is finished, paid in full. That's the question, paid what? Paid what for what? What's he paying? Satan? No. No. He's paying the demands of a holy God. He's coming before the just judge and making payment 
for you. In fact, if I were to just read an important passage of scripture for you, uh, Romans 5, people know Romans 5, 8 very, very easily. If, you're, if you've been a believer, follower after Christ, Romans 5, 8 is probably something that if you can't quote it, if I start to recite it, you'll know. Uh, it, it says to us, uh, but God demonstrates his own love towards us and while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. We love that, right? God loves me right where I'm at. <laughs> While we're a sinner, Christ died for me. He loves me that much. It's a great verse. But then when you consider Jesus paying what? When Jesus had paid in full, what what did he pay? Verse 9 and 10, listen to this, goes on and says, much more than having now been justified or being made right by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. What did Jesus pay? The demands of just God, the wrath of God that was to be poured out on sinners. And so you see the, the justice of God in, in, in Christ being made known and the grace of God, the love of God being displayed for us because of what Jesus has done. Temples, bulls, goats, they're just shadows of what Jesus would ultimately do. And so verse eight and nine goes on after saying above sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have not desired nor have you taken pleasure in them which are offered according to the law. Then he said, behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. What he's saying to us is that Jesus Jesus completely eradicates Old Testament, Old Covenant, and presents New Covenant for us in Him. In fact, if you remember in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13, it said, when he, when he said, Jesus, a new covenant, He has made the first obsolete. It's literally telling us He obliterated. Jesus obliterates the Old Covenant by fulfilling it in Himself when He said, it is finished, paid in full. In Mark 10 verse 45, he said, he gave his life as a ransom to purchase you. Jesus fulfills the old covenant. In fact, if you were to look at the Old Testament, and you've seen this communicated in Hebrews, I just haven't specifically identified it for you, that Jesus fulfilled uh, the multiple covenants in, in, in the Old Testament. He, he, he fulfilled the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant. Now, if you're looking at these and you're wondering, what in the world is it talking about? Well, in Genesis, in chapter 15, I think it's my favorite chapter in this. I've underlined the most important passages to these fulfillments. In Genesis 15, God comes to Abraham and he creates the Abrahamic covenant with him. And he says to Abraham, through you, I will bless all nations. In Hebrews 6, it talks about the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. In the Mosaic Covenant, in the giving of the law, in Exodus 19, verses 5 and 8, it says that God gave the law, gave the covenant in verse 5, and in verse 8, the people say, may we fulfill this covenant. Now, we learn about the Old Testament laws, no human being could truly fulfill it except for God in the flesh, which is Christ. And that's why he says in Hebrews 8, 13, that he has fulfilled it and obliterated the Old Covenant. And there's the Davidic Covenant. The one who is coming would only satisfy the law, the just demands of the Lord. He, he would be king and priest himself. And we saw this through the idea of the Melchizedek priesthood and what that symbolizes and how no one can fulfill it, no one can be it except for Jesus alone. The fulfillment of it comes from Psalm chapter 110 verses 1 to 4. But it's based on the covenantal promise to King David in 2 Samuel chapter 11 to verse 16. That one who is coming from the lineage of David would be king forever. Jesus. And Jesus fulfills all of these pictures. And, and so it says to us, then in verse 10 to 13, uh, it says, By this will we have been sanctified, talking about what Jesus has done, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Every priest, talking about the Old Testament now, every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. They're shadows. But in verse 12, but he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. So re-quoting again of, of Psalm 110 and verse 1. But this statement, guys, 
this statement of, of, of Jesus sitting down at the right hand of God, we've talked about this, but this is a, a scandalous, even insulting statement in, in the mind of Jewish tradition if you were to put your faith in, in religious living. Because in the temple, the priests never sat down. There was never enough that could be done. Constantly, every day performing, is this enough, God? Is this enough? And it's, it's never intended to fully satisfy because all it, all it was was a shadow. So in verse 13, Jesus now waiting for that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. Quoting Psalm 110 where Jesus is king. And then he gives us this verse. Verse 14. Which I should tell you guys, if, if anything in this this section of scripture, if there's just one section of, of this portion we've gone through together that you, you let your soul just saturate what's contained in, in this passage, it is this verse. It's the application of this verse to your life forever as a follower of Jesus. And so it says this, for by one offering, it has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. Let me ask you, how much of time is included in the phrase all time? All of it, right? Past, present, future. When Jesus died for you, he covered all of you in all time. Any sin that you've done in the past, anything that you do today, and anything that you're going to do tomorrow. His sacrifice was all-encompassing sufficient. I had recently, within the last 12 months, someone, uh, I can't remember what day it was, I think it was a Wednesday, came, came through the church and with this pressing question on their mind. How do I know that Jesus is enough? Like, why, why, why do I not have to add more to it? Why, why in, in trusting in him do I not, when I go mess up, need to just religiously continue to perform just to make up for all of that? What, what keeps me from needing to do that in my life? The passage it took them to. Hebrews 10, verse 14. By one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. So it's saying in, in your faith in Jesus, God always and all time and trusting in Christ sees the blood of Christ over your life. This, this is saying to you, this is the enriching of my own soul, the, the teaching in my own life from this passage of scripture. When I, when I mess up, my tendency in a religious mindset is to beat myself up, going through the range of experience of being, being a, a failure. Why did I do that? You know, why, why did I disappoint myself? How could God love me? But may I ask you, what's the point of repentance? And if you answer that question in a religious framework versus what this passage is saying from a religious framework, it's all about beating you up, making you be punished because of, of the things that you've done wrong. But the point of repentance isn't about your punishment. It's about experiencing the relationship with Christ for which you were created. It's not about walking in guilt and shame until you feel like it's enough because that's going back to shadows. It's about looking at the sufficiency of Jesus and turning to him again and saying, thank you, God, that your sacrifice sufficient forever and always in my life. Even when I disappoint myself and the failures of what I've done, you still accept me. You love me. God, you make me new. You give me a place to stand to refresh my soul and be embraced by you. Past, present, and future. Religious people have a hard time with this verse. Because you can't control what people do, right? 
We've got to guilt and shame and come up with a list of rules and expectations and everyone's got to live on it. But you read the new covenant and the new covenant is the transforming from the inside out. It's, it's the writing of the law on the heart. It's living out the fruit of the spirit. It's not, it's not about religious legalism. It's about surrendering to Jesus and letting him do his work in me. Now, no doubt, sometimes the indication of our life might present that I am not surrendering to Jesus. But here at Alpine Bible Church, we're not about behavior modification, but heart transformation. The greatest thing I could say to you this morning isn't go do this and that. It's give your heart to Jesus. See everything that Christ has done for you and the love that's been lavished and to the extent that he is God and how that sacrifice is sufficient in everything. You will never be loved at any greater in depth than what Jesus has done for you and give your heart to that. Live for that king in that glory and what he has called you to in him. You know what Satan likes to do? It's not sufficient. Does God really know who you are? Oh, you messed up again. God doesn't want to be near you. And the cross of Christ and everything screams a God that has just been pursuing you with all that he has to offer so that you can enjoy his presence forever for which you were created to belong. I mean, this verse for us is everything in understanding the sufficiency of Jesus in our lives. I need to close. Let me just say, here, here are a few things to understand if struggling with legalism. Here, here's some tendencies in the way that we think. Um, you know, when someone's a legalist, they don't walk around saying, uh, you know, my name's John. I'm a legalist. <laughs> what, they, what typically is said is that they call themselves biblical, and I'm just doing what the Bible teaches, you know. But, but one of the ways to recognize your, your heart wrestles with it is Maybe you believe some people are just too far gone for Christ to reach. And typically that mentality tends to think that someone needs to first change before they can accept Jesus. Or you want people to make you feel comfortable before they can belong and attend your church. Oh, you're not going to be accepted, right? Or you confuse the idea of religious tradition with the substance and power that really belongs to Jesus? Or how about this? You think you need to be resaved when you falter as a believer? Jesus holds you in his hand. Jesus' cross was more than enough. As I look forward to this next week, but I just want you to know, not only did he reconcile your account as what's been wronged against God, the sin, but he's given you a completely new identity in him. Your royalty. Jesus' sacrifice is enough. So let me just close... Well, let me, let me read this last so we can say we read the whole passage. Uh, by the way, I, I skipped Romans 9, um, verses 16 to 22 last week. Now that we've talked about covenant and Jesus, if you go back and read Romans 9, 16, and the idea that Jesus is the covenant fulfillment, and you read covenant like it's a will, like someone's will and testament when they die and producing that covenant, it will make sense. But Romans 10 says it like this, and the Holy Spirit also testifies to us for us after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days. Uh, saying, says the Lord, I will put my laws upon their heart and on their mind, I will write them. So God's the one that transforms from the inside. And then he says, and their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. Uh, now where there is forgiveness of these things, there's no longer any offering for sin. It's like we come to Jesus and we say, God, okay, I went and I sacrificed this. Or Jesus, I'm doing all this. Will you, now will you accept me? He's like, I'm not taking that. I'm not taking that. I've already paid it. What in the world are you going to add to what I've already done when the king of all glory becomes flesh and dies for your sins? I'm not taking that. I don't care what special place you think you've gone to, what laws you think you fulfilled, what sacrifices you think you made. That's not what makes you acceptable before God. It's my blood. 
It's me who died in your place. Do you understand how much I love you? I mean, when you think of every excuse in this world why God wouldn't accept you, why you don't belong with him, yeah, they, they might be good excuses, but not before the Lord. And he has paid it all. Because you're created to belong to him forever, and he's extended that and lavished that love on you for all of eternity so that you could be in his presence forever. He created that celestial kingdom for you to enjoy his glory forever. There is no earning it. There is no degrees to it. It's his presence or nothing. It's Jesus is sufficient or nothing. It doesn't accept the meagerness of our sacrifices. It's him. You're called to belong. Guys, can I tell you, the, the thought today isn't just to say, do you, do you intellectually assent to what I'm saying? Like, do you logically believe it? But rather, beyond that, more than just intellectually, oh, I believe it, but has your heart surrendered to it and embraced it? Do you allow your soul to, to grip this and say, Jesus, you are enough. Jesus, today, make me new. I'm not Lord, but you are. It's more than shadows. The substance belongs to Christ. Let me share this last story. Um, John Newton, writer of Amazing Grace. He lived a life of debauchery before Christ rescued his soul. And as he got to the end of his life, he kept remarking that his memory was fading. But one truth he continued to say he allowed himself to rest on. And he said it like this. I am a great sinner, but Christ is an even greater Savior. Because if I could tell you anything freeing to our heart, it's the identity for which we receive because of what Christ has done. Past, present, and future, Jesus is enough.